Hey, hey guys, welcome, welcome to Tactical Tuesday. So you are in Fearless Investors. We have a live show every single Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Today, well, we've got a doozy for you. Um, it's one of those topics that everyone's got questions about. No one, you know, no one's really familiar. It's it's kind of a new thing that's kind of floating around that everyone is using, um, but it's kind of new. So we're going to talk today about what exactly that is. So just like our email today said, uh, GPLP, what the, um, you know, heck. So we don't know what it is. We've got to... Um, investors here today that are going to help us with figuring out what it all is as well as answering some of your questions. So if you have wondered about it, the GPLP, what is it? How does it work? Why would we use it? All of that kind of stuff, then today is your day. So we've got some uh, guests with us today. So say hi guys as you come on. I see some of you are. Thank you. That's awesome. Look at you guys. All you Igniteds are always the first in there. So Ryan from New Brunswick. Um, yeah, I was really having FOMO uh, with your with your thing last week. <laughs> um, so Ryan's doing some crazy great stuff with Ashley, his wife, and um, Melanie Robinson. Got lots of stuff going on in St. John's. St. John, New Brunswick. <laughs> uh, Chris, Sunny Whitby. That's awesome because we do not have sun here. Adele, Aaron, Dwight. Oh, from Belmont. Beautiful. All right. So, um, yeah, we have guest host, I believe is next week, Ryan. So guest hosts um, from our Ignited crew. But today we are doing, um, we're just talking to our guests today. We've got um, Hermel and Nico from Sunset Investments, and uh, they're really going to break down what is a GPLP and why do we want to use it or not to use it? What are the cons? What are the pros? Um, all that kind of stuff. Hey, Samir, nice to see you. <laughs> right, Adele? I feel like Robert Room sometimes, and I never got my name said either because my name was weird. Like now it's around, but Tiffany was, yeah, never Sarah, Michael, David, you know, all of those. Anyways, all right. So um, we are going to bring them on right now. Let's do this, guys. Hey, hey, welcome. Well, hello. Nice to see you. Nice How's to see you, okay, so boop, boop. <laughs> This is so you guys are going to recognize for sure at least one of these faces, maybe both. Um, so, Mel, why don't you introduce yourself first, and then we'll go on to Nico. You guys can introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about how you know each other and the roles that you play within your company. So we can go forward from there. For sure. Uh, so I'm Hermel Gabu. You guys might know me already from being a fearless member and ignited member now for going on a year in July. Has it been a year? Wow. That's uh, it. And the <laughs> stuff that you're doing is unreal. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm my partner in crime, Rachel is always hiding behind the scenes because that's where she <laughs> likes to, to do the best of her work. She's like the young, the undercover investor. She's like my, uh, my backbone say, or I think my yeah. person, you know, she's the backup. So yeah, we've been uh, real estate investing for a, a little over a year now started with, uh, you know, two doors, uh, duplex side by side and had no clue what we were doing. And we wanted to scale and had no clue what we were doing. So we decided to get some help, got introduced to Tiffany, Fearless, Corey, and then we, we drank the Kool-Aid, got ignited and, <laughs> and made a whole bunch of connections. Um, we connected with uh, Benoit Sturel, which is our partner uh, for uh, Sunset Investor, that uh, Sunset Investment Group that uh, couldn't make tonight, unfortunately. Uh, and then uh, through Benoit, again, the connections kind of just happen we uh we were introduced with nico and his lovely wife maria and uh and their working group to uh to make the team we're at today awesome. so, yeah, so you're an that, investor you're a general partner in sunset yep. sunset investments yep. um yep. and nico what's your what's your role who are you and what do you bring to the table sure well well thanks for having us on so my name is nico bautista been a fearless member for about two going on three years um investor in the sense that we've been investing in real estate for about seven years now uh everything from private lending to fix and flips to buy and holds but the secret sauce for us is the multifamily development space uh so my wife and i were both lawyers and so that's part of the reason why i think we're here today 
to give you a sense of what uh, what's true and what's not true necessarily about GP and LP status. And so on our team, for Sunset Investments, we're, we're in charge of legal and investor relations. So dealing with investors, but dealing with legal and making sure we're compliant. But more importantly, seeing how we can use the law to our benefit. And that's a, it's a key component of making any kind of deal work. So i um, happy to be here tonight. Awesome. And for me, I always love dealing with a professional that is in the trenches themselves doing it. Because, you know, if you work for a client and you've got, you know, to figure out some logistics or maybe some tax benefits or some legalities of things, you know, if you work for a client, there's, you know, you're going to look into it so much and you're going to do a good job and that's great. But when you're doing it for yourself, as you go along your life, things will pop up that you go, oh, wait interesting that's applicable here or there and so anytime there's someone that's in the trenches like yourself um huge benefit to us so guys if you didn't hear that uh nico is a lawyer he is in the trenches he's an investor himself and he is with hermel and their wives as well as uh benoit they are all spearheading this group to do these multifamily developments but they're structuring structuring it differently than what we have seen in the past, in the recent years. And, you know, guys, you'll hear us say this all the time, that the lending environment will make us change all over the place. You know, and we've got all these rumors of stuff that's coming next year for investors, you know, 30% down and all these things. We adjust every time there's a new announcement or a new new legislation, we adjust. And one of the ways that a lot of people are adjusting right now instead of using joint venture agreements, uh, because a lot of the financing companies are not loving those. Instead of doing that, there's a lot of this talk about a GPLP. So let's go to you, Nico, and let's talk quickly about what exactly does that stand for? Um, I love that you've got the legal terms, but you're also got the layman terms. So what does it sure. mean for us? Um, I don't actually, I always invite Mel to go first in the sense that uh, he, he knows the lay of the land and in a way sometimes can best describe it to, 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 to the everyday common folk. And I'll back it up with some technical stuff. But Mel, why don't you start off with the GPLP? All right. I'll, I'll leave some meat on the bone for you there, Nico. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a preferred way to do it for, for a lot of investment groups because uh, it has there, there's a niche, there's a. Um, there's a need to be compliant, right? So there, there's a need to uh, to have a, a good legal team that that will back up and draft those those agreements, that draft those term sheets, and uh, and basically uh, uh, register uh, help us register with the Securities Commission, right? Okay. Um, so before before we get to that though, what mm -hmm. is a GPLP like? What does it stand okay. for? Is it a corporate structure? Is it you know, what kind of is it for those of us who've never really heard of it or really heard of the details of it? Okay, so there's two groups. There's the general partners group, which are Nico, his wife, myself, Rachel, and, and Benoit. Uh, we, we constitute one group and uh, we also create the LP. We create the LP and we're part of the LP as, as, as like a B shareholder. Um, so we, we direct and buy, uh, buy the asset uh in name of the lp uh, so the limited partners uh, limited partners are constituted of investors that come in for a predetermined amount uh, of, of of investment and uh, and uh, we we have a term sheet labeling what they what they need to put in how much how long um all that 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 jazz i'll leave that for for nico to elaborate a little bit more on uh, but then it, it brings a lot of benefits um, I think the best appeal for me, if I'm if I'm looking in as if I was to invest, would I want to with a, with a group? Would I want to put up all my assets as security? Would I would I want to be exposed to the weight of the loan as an investor? If if I'm an if I'm a limited partner coming into and I'm asked to contribute to this project, would I want to de-risk my position or increase my risk? So the LP structure lets us really de-risk the position of our investors and makes it very appealing. Okay, so um, let's 
let's let's break it down a little bit and say okay so we use most of us are kind of familiar with a joint rent venture structure where we have one person's the money partner does you know all the financial stuff another person does all the work puts in all the time brings the expertise they come together they get a contract that says who does what and who's splitting what kind of profits and so that's kind of been traditional over the last 20 or so years that we've been investing as the way to do it but what we found is that banks aren't liking that structure as much anymore and kind of limiting that. So there's a new structure. Now it's the GP stands for general partner. Mm -hmm. And then the LP st stands for limited partners. Limited. Yeah. Right? So it's kind of the same idea where there's the GP is that kind of hands on, you know, in the trenches, operational, um, partner in this scenario and then the limited partners are basically investors they can invest but they are not hands-on do i have that right yeah they're not hands-on and their risk is limited to their investment as the general partner when we decide to apply for financing for uh for the for the asset we're uh we're putting up our houses and our assets and our corpse um uh, as a guarantee so we're not asking the, 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 the investors to do that. We're, we're taking that on ourselves. So uh, basically compared to a JV partnership or a universal shareholder agreement, where it's partners are required to sign as guarantors, right? Uh, in the JV partnership, how often do you see that the JV partner, the money partner has to bring in the bank loan and the down payment and the closing costs, right? So the risk is kind of, a, a little lopsided that's why banks are, 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 are not frowning on it but they don't prefer that uh, as a as a working order that's for sure so uh so that's why this this approach is making it a little more de-risked for the for the investor yeah awesome um so nico maybe you want to hit this one so is the lps subsidiary company under the gp company no it's not so um, if you think about it this way, and, and Tiffany, I'll use your terms, the working partner is the GP in your formal, in your, you know, your, your usual JV structure. And your money partner is your LP for the most part. Now, the way that it's structured, so two different companies, GP on one side and LP on the other, um, working partner on one side, money partner is on the other. Um, the only difference is that and for tax reasons, which is a lovely subject in its own self, um, the way that the working partners get their sweat equity in the deal is also as being part of the limited partnership. So everyone all together is part of the LP agreement, but as for the general partners, that's just the working people. And that's just the people as Mel was saying, is putting up the bank loan and doing all the sweat equity and all the hard work. So the limited partnership typically has two classes of shares. The first is for the investors. And then the second is for the sweat equity, which is in your typical JV agreement, you know, a profit split of 50, 50 or something like that. It's the same idea. Perfect. Okay. So it's two different corporations that you're, that's that, right. that you're creating. One is going to be the general partner that's doing a lot of the work. The other one is going to be holding all the investors money and bringing them together. And the liability, like Carmel was saying, the liability sticks with the general partner uh, corporation, not the LP, which is, you know, a lot of you guys, when we, you know, you join Fearless and we ask you, what's your number one obstacle or fear? Um, you know, a lot of you say is, is taking risk. And so, you know, the beautiful part of this is that there isn't, um, that, that risk becomes more, more, not a hundred percent, but more on the GP side of things. So that's one beautiful thing about, this structure which again is replacing like a joint venture kind of structure okay so we've got our roles down pat we understand what the structure is it's two separate corporations um who owns those corporations uh well the G the gp own the gp <laughs> so the partners inside the gp own the gp and everybody uh that's on the uh on the the 
uh, the registry. So the shareholder registry for the LP as class A or class B, or how, however amount of uh, class of shares there's available are all owners in their equity stake. So okay. if, you, if your investment required you to put in 100,000 for 5%, you own 5% of the LP. So, that's, that's so if I own 5% of the LP, then I, I get to have 5% of say then because I own 5% and I'm an owner in that corporation? Or what does the B shares that I've been assigned, uh, what do they do for me or for, yeah, in this situation? So any, any kind of shares, I mean, any kind of company can have different rights attached. For the most part, when you get sophisticated investment groups like Sunset, what we say to our investors is that it's a completely passive deal, which means that, yes, you do get votes. But for the most part, uh, we, the general partner, because we're management, because we're working partners, we don't want to have to have every single IKEA furniture receipt approved by you. Um, we are going to have certain expenses where we set a threshold. If you know if there's an expense over $10,000 for it, we've got to take it to a vote. Um, but if not, if it's sub 10,000 or 15,000, similar to JV agreements, that's on us to decide. So you have a vote, yes, but there are some things that you don't get to vote on. And okay. that's, the, that's the easiest way to go about doing things. Yes, and and so that, that really clearly kind of shows that this is a passive, very passive investment for those on the LP side. So it's not like in a joint venture partnership where you're 50 50 on this property and, you know, sometimes you're in and sometimes you're out and all that kind of thing. This is a very passive investment where the general partners are running the show. So do we have to get to know the general partners? That's the question. So here's two general partners sitting right in front of us, Sunset Investments. Let's talk a little bit about how, you know, um, we'll get back to the structure of a GPLP because that's important. But let's sure. talk a little bit about what you guys are doing and why you chose to go with this structure for the, the projects that you guys are working on. So, um, First hand, well, there's a lot of the projects we're working on. We, we call them our unicorns uh, because they're very, very rare and uh, their uh, their return rates are, are pretty, pretty amazing. So uh, uh, not to toot my own horn, but <laughs> so uh, what there's a lot of restructuring to happen. So, so on, on our end, uh, since we're near the app that Rachel and I control more of the day to day stuff where the customer uh, customer relation, tenant relations, uh, construction crew, uh, you know, on the ground, direct handling. Uh, so, so that's, that's what our, our portion of the deal with. We also, we also like to do, um, a lot of the advertising and, uh, and, uh, uh social media aspect of, of, of everything. Uh, we take care of the, you know, the, the MailChimp and the, the job form and all those things. So, uh, so inside our group, we have basically a working order, right? We, we all have a, a, a pre-delineated amount of tasks, uh, a preset. And, and of course, proximity makes us, uh, Rachel and I here on this end, a little more apt to do certain tasks because we're, we're, we can be hands-on and direct eyesight. Yeah, which is great because boots on the ground, guys, boots on the ground watching your investment is priceless. There's... There's no price that you can put on that when, uh, you know, you're calling for a plumber to go and turn off water that's spurting from some pipes and you can't find a plumber, at, you know, 2 a.m. to have someone that's going to like jump out of bed and go. I mean, it's not their job per se, but when it's their baby, you know that they're going to they're going to do that. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's it's, a, yeah, it's, so, it's so like crazy. forcing deals, uh, getting the team up and running local local uh, local assets local partners and stuff like that uh, that's been that's been that is a, a lot of our of our duties we we have to maintain those relations nurture them uh, make sure everybody's happy we want everybody to grow together right it's a it's a it's a it's a team effort so uh, so by uplifting everyone and giving everybody opportunity uh, that's how we're able to, to to keep going and finding good deals i don't know if uh, nico wanted to add uh, yeah. So uh, I'll say this coming from the perspective of the investor, because I'm an investor. And before we started Sunset and invested in other deals, we were invested in other deals, some ranging from joint ventures, some in unanimous shareholders agreements, some 
just, you know, a sheet of tissue paper where we hope for the best because they were our best buddy and we thought all things would go well. Um, and I'll tell you this, both as a lawyer and again, everything we say tonight, my hope is that you take this as an invitation to go ask your own lawyer for their own legal advice. But I would say that if you're a passive investor and you're looking for a safe and secure way of investing your funds, if the operator, the GP, the working partner is not operating as a general partner, limited partnership, you need to ask the question, why not? Because the GP LP structure is by far the most investor friendly protection that you can have as an investor. Okay, so, so tell me we'll why. go through some. Yeah, we'll, we'll go through that right now uh, because yeah. some people are always wondering. And I see that there was a question um, from, from, from Mary Mestre, sorry if I mispronounced her name, about in this arrangement, the liability for the LP is only based on the money they bring in. That's correct. So then let's give a really easy example. We're in a joint venture and I'm in for 25%, Mel's in for 25%, uh, Tiffany's in for 25%, and you, investor, are in for the last quarter percent. And uh, according to the joint venture agreement, we all own a quarter. And the, the hard part though, is that our budget was a little bit small and the contractors went over budget, uh, timing went long. And as a result, we have a, I don't know, a $50,000 deficit that we need to pay. In a usual joint venture agreement or shareholder agreement, we would all be on the hook for 25% of that deficit that we'd all have to chip in for that. Yep. Fair is fair. Yep. In the limited partnership agreement, that is not the case. That $50,000 overrun is mine and Hermel's problem alone. That's the GP's problem for messing up. It is not the investor's fault that we didn't deliver as promised. So number one, you're not in, you're not responsible for any cost overrun in, 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 in accounting or tax or law terms, we call it a cash call or a capital call or a deficit repayment. That's not the case in a limited partnership. So if I'm an investor, why would I sign up for something where I might be on the hook for a little bit of a cash call? Doesn't make any sense. I only want to put in my investment and know that at worst, I lose that and it goes to zero, but you're not going to ask me for more money. Second example, uh, all hell breaks loose. And for whatever reason, you know, there are, there are 30 burst pipes. Insurance doesn't cover everything. Again, that's Mel, Rachel, mine, Maria, Benoit's problem. That's our house on the line. We got to sort that problem out. We're not asking the investors to make up that deficit. Um, okay, so cool. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I'm just going to say, what if you can't? See, as a joint venture partner, a money partner, I know that, hey, listen, if something goes wrong and my, my partners can't take care of it, then I, if I have to throw in some money, I've already counted on this. I know the market. I know whatever. I'm okay with that. I can come in and swoop in. Now, what if, as a money partner, I'm looking at you guys and say, okay, that's great. I know they have lots of assets. I know they're smart investors. I know they're great. But what if you can't? Then what happens? If we couldn't, we would not be getting the bank loan. So as part of the CMH or as part of the financing application, whether that's through a conventional bank, through CMHC, the Canadian Housing Mortgage Company, even to a private lender, we as general partners have to put all our financials, we're, we're, we're stark naked. We show it all and we say, this is what our assets are. Um, and they have to be uh, satisfied that we would have to sell our home to basically do whatever it takes to come up with the shortfall. They will not lend us if we're just straight up no assets and hoping for the best. So the takeaway there is, although the um, the conventional thought and the myth is that you know con that commercial buildings finance themselves because they're a business and they don't look at your credit score and they look strictly at if the building cash flows and if it's good to go. That's not perfectly true. What they also want to see is that if all hell breaks loose that the general partners can cover for it. So they're not going to lend us $20 million if they don't think we're up for the task. Okay. So that's awesome. That's their, that's their stop gap. And worst case scenario, you, and, and this is kind of what I'm, you know, hearing from people is, you know, that's great that you're taking all the risk, but what if something goes wrong? I don't have any say. 
And that's what we're hearing. So what you're saying is for one, you've been vetted from the, you know, from the people that are underwriting all this kind of stuff. For two, you've got your house on the line. Mel and Benoit have their houses, their assets, their RSPs. They've got all of these things on the line. And that is what is set as collateral for this. So there is collateral sitting there if something should go wrong. It's not it's not just a matter of, well, can you hustle and get this done? No, there's a plan in place for it already. Yes. Right. Awesome. So just, just going back a little bit, which corporation owns the property? I'm not sure if we answered this or not. So The limited partnership owns the company. So think of the general partner as the management company. The limited partnership is what's registered on title. Uh, so if you're a Sunset investor, you get a copy of the title uh, registration, which shows that you are at a Sunset Investments, LP is the one that uh, owns the property. And then you get a copy of the share certificate, like you should, like any proper company should. And, you know, I, I, I hasten to say that not all investors kind of get that certainty, but ours do. Um, and so the LP is what's registered on title. Sometimes the general partner is registered on title just because the bank wants that certainty. But there is a background understanding that 100% of the equity is owned by the limited partnership. Awesome. Okay. And again, let's talk then that kind of feeds into another point of, of the limited partnerships then is, so does each project get, so you have one GP company, like you guys are, you guys have your company together. Okay. Now there's an LP for, let's say you're building in Moncton that you are redoing into student rentals. Okay. So that's got an LP that's being managed by this GP. Is there another LP that takes on your next building, your next project, or does that go within that one LP as well? Uh, we like to separate it so that each project gets its own LP and GP. Uh, there are some tax reasons for that. Uh, you know, from our point of view, we love to save our investors tax where we can, we'll do it. Uh, because we're in the same boat. Um, and the other reason is because for, for liability reasons, we want to make sure that just if one building, something happens to one building, it doesn't affect the investors on another. So um, everybody gets their own. It's always a separate set each time. Perfect. Yeah. So this question led us perfectly into that. So whoever you are, Facebook user, thank you for that question. Because um, one of the main benefits of having this GPLP structure is the fact that it does limit liability um, within the different corporations and different structures so that if, you know, someone, you know, gets involved in something too big or something doesn't go right in one area, it's not going to affect your investment, whereas otherwise it could. So that's part of one of the benefits to doing this this structure is that it does limit liabilities um, in that way. So perfect uh, way to segue into that. So thank you for that question. Anybody has any questions, guys, go ahead and throw it in the chat. Um, we'll get these guys to answer it. Um, you know, people doing it that's, you know, in the trenches, uh, never mind a lawyer, but never mind someone who's boots on the ground doing this every day. By the great opportunity to get your questions answered so mm -hmm. um awesome okay so ah huh, there we go i'll just reiterate uh or adele's reiterating saying like yeah it's not perfectly true that the the building runs itself and adele would know too right so um all right tori do you the gps cover the cost of forming both corps on new deals and what is the cost? perfect tori thank you what is the cost of doing so uh, depending on your friendly neighborhood lawyer, and I would suggest that you go with a securities lawyer and not your, just your random local lawyer who doesn't really do securities. Um, an LP does a GP and LP typically cost somewhere between 15 to 20,000. It is steep. Um, you know, there is a portion of that that you in theory could repurpose for your second and third and fourth deals. Um, but the, the initial startup cost is, is, is unfriendly. And that's kind of why we think. There aren't too many GPs and LPs floating around in existence. I want to spend two minutes though about why um, we're seeing a little bit more of that and why I think that that's actually, again, if you're an investor, the way you need to be looking at. And similarly, if you are a working partner, um, start considering this. Um, you know, I've been in the fearless space. We've seen a lot of people doing private lending. We've seen a lot of people who were part of some other real estate groups that have since become scrutiny for securities commission situations. Um, I won't name them, but some of us, even myself, have, have had unfriendly circumstances behind that as well. 
what we need to be clear about is that whenever we are in, whenever we are offering an investor, a money partner, an in real estate investment opportunity where they do nothing, they're just passive. Even if that means they qualify for the mortgage, that's debatable. But beyond that, they do nothing. And you sit back, they sit back. And as the investor, they chill, they collect the returns. And you as the working partner do everything. You are offering them an investment opportunity, which means that that's security. Okay. And when it's a security that falls under the securities regulations in America, the, secu the SEC, the Securities Commission in Canada is basically the same thing. We play by very similar rules. And because of that, there is a limit to whom you can ask for money from before you could get in trouble. Now, whether you ask and take the risk of getting in trouble or you just decide to do it anyway is completely your choice. But as a lawyer, if I was to say you're fully compliant, the only two real ways that you can ask for money would be from people that are clearly your friends and family or what we would call accredited investors. And accredited investors, and I'll quickly define that, would be people who are either high income earners or very wealthy. If they're high income earners, that means that for the last two years, they themselves have $200,000 in income. Um, and if they have a spouse, they can combine it to be 300,000 in income. So that's the high income earners. If you're independently wealthy, that means that you've got 1 million in assets, liquid assets, meaning stocks, cash, the cash surrender value of life insurance policies. That's one bucket. Or to include real estate, $5 million minus or net of any mortgages or lines of credit attached. So you got $5 million equity in real estate plus financial assets. Those are the buckets that you can safely play in. Uh, the reason why people are turning towards the GP LP status, if you are in the working partner situation, is because the law clearly states that you can fish in those ponds, the accredited investor or the friends and family, because those are the exemptions available under the GP LP status. No questions asked, securities won't come after you for that. That's okay. why people do it. Yeah, so so just to, to really reiterate, um, if you are offering publicly an investment, you need to be licensed. And if you're not licensed, you're gonna find yourself in hot water. So what, what uh, Nico is saying is that if you structure it within this GPLP, that gets you out of there. You don't have to worry about that part, okay? So that's a main benefit for why you guys went after this structure, which is fantastic. And one of those things, you are a securities lawyer, is that correct, Nico? I'm not a securities lawyer, um, so I'm a tax tax and trust lawyer. But as a result of doing all this, you know, we know what we're doing here is pretty similar. Um, yeah. But like all things, we invite you to ask your securities lawyer uh, for for proper instructions and advice. Perfect. So okay, so let's let's answer the first part of Tori's question. Does the GP cover the cost? Mm -hmm. So that fifteen to twenty grand that you're talking about, who covers that cost of setting this structure up? Uh, depends on your operator. Um, so for us, uh, we cover some of that, uh, not all. Um, and on others, it, it really depends. So, so some of the hundred grand that like we're talking hundred grand that kind of thrown, thrown uh, around. 15 to, 20, 15 to 20 is probably the, 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 the ballpark of it. Um, yeah. So as an investor, if I'm putting in a hundred grand, does some of my money go toward that structure then as well? Uh, some of it, yes, but we actually typically take it from the financing proceeds. So we don't ask the the that we don't ask the investor to pay for it. It, it comes out of the financing and the awesome. overall budget. Yeah. And then, how is the profit shared? So now we've talked about how some of the expenses are paid, and how is the profit shared? Is it purely based on the shares and the percentages? Well, you got to go and ask your operator, uh, your working partner, your general partner, what the deal is. So every deal will be different, you know, just as every joint venture agreement is different. Some people split 50 50, some people split 70 30, but you need to get 100% cash flow for the first two years. It's the same. You'd really just have to read what that specific deal is all about, and they will tell you what it is. So, for example, on our last couple deals, um, Mel, correct me if I'm wrong, but what we're, what we're offering is hundred percent of the cash flow goes to the investors until they get at least 70% of their money back yep. at least. 
And beyond that, once we do that, uh, you know, it's a split of 51, 49, and we'll talk about, we can spend some time about why it's 51, 49. It's really because of financing rules. Um, it's close to 50, 50. We don't think the investors cry for 1% because if they gave up that 1%, uh, they would have to sign all the credit applications and it's not worth it. Yeah, no, for sure. I'm sure, I'm sure no one's going to squawk about that. So, okay. So on your deals, you are offering 70% back until they get their money back. And then it's a 50, 149 share on based on percentages. Yeah. So a hundred percent of their money, a hundred percent of the cash flow, whether that's from cash flow or refinance and Mel can spend some time about the magic work that we do behind the scenes in the refinance work until they get at least 70%. So these are, the, this is the current deal, for example, um, for educational purposes only, as we should say. Um, and then once they get their 70% back, then it's 51, 49 other deals might look different, but for example, let's just chat about that one. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. And I saw Mel, I saw your presentation on it. So, um, yeah. I love how it was all laid out. Once you get your money back, this is how the numbers are going to look and all that kind of stuff. That looked awesome. So um, the, when we, uh, when we make those projections and calculations and stuff, uh, take into account that we always put in a bit of like what we see as best case scenario, we always tweak it down some. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's an, there's an invisible buffer. Uh, there for for conservative purposes because uh, we always there's it's very hard to plan for contingency but if you if you dial your numbers down rather than up uh, and and lay on the conservative side you know the as long as the picture that you're painting for your investor is uh is still very positive it's still making the investment a, a viable one knowing that there is room for wiggle inside those numbers for for more lift nobody's going to be upset if i tell them i'm reimbursing 80 or 85 percent of their investment after year one when we've committed to 70 percent after two years right so uh but if it's the opposite way around then we're looking into some people that will be a little more upset than than when we first set off the so for sure yeah under promise over deliver right yeah okay so is there a minimum number of people that you need in each corporation the gp and the lp i assume there is not, but you know, in order to make it make some sense, I mean, listen, if you've got a big whale of a client, you probably don't need a GPLP if it's just one huge investor. Um, but that being said, there are tax benefits to having the LP GP arrangement. Um, I noticed that Zoria had a comment and, and I think uh, there's another individual who was asking about tax as well, um, which may make sense just because of the scale of the project to do. so. Um, Zoria's comment that, you know, the, the LP is a separate entity that doesn't file its own taxes is, is correct. Basically what happens is the project spits out a certain amount of, of, of profit or loss. I'm going to compare it to a joint venture agreement because this is what most fearless people are, you know, used to. And so am I, um, you set up a holding company, right? A brand new company. It owns shares. It owns the property. Each of the shareholders, the investors, the working partners have shares in it. The fun, unfun, whatever, how you ever want to call it. If you're the CRA, you'll say it's fun. If you're the investor, you say it's not so fun. Um, when it's time to file taxes and you've got a profit, the unfortunate part is because it's a holding company, a company, you get taxed at two levels. Once at that holding company level, and then secondly, as a shareholder. And if you're a shareholder, if you are investing as a holding company yourself, then you've got a third level of tax, which is really un unfortunate in that sense. So at least two levels of tax at the company level that owns the property. And then you yourself as a shareholder at the LP GP structure, the LP does not pay tax. What it does is it basically allocates the tax to each of its individual shareholders. So there's just that one level of tax, which is beautiful because you don't get dinged twice. I don't want to pay an extra level if I don't have to. And more importantly, you're not paying an extra shareholder. Um, you know, you're not, on the hook for other people's um, tax issues either. It's just very clean. And if you're a sunset investor and we're able to do one better, which is to claim a lot of expenses, renovation costs, insurance costs, you know, interest costs, you might actually end up with cash back in your pocket because we return you your capital, 
but at the same time got some expenses to deduct against your regular income. So not a bad deal. That's a double whammy in our books. So the GPLP structure is quite, quite a good idea for tax purposes in that sense. We were just talking to our um, accountant about it, George at uh, BDO, and, and we we're just talking about kind of the nuances of all this in prep for, you know, what we're doing here tonight. And, and uh, again, we'll be doing another one here soon. But, um, you know, the tax structure um, certainly is very favorable. Um, and it's interesting because it does bring up the next two questions that we've got here are, uh, is there a minimum? Oh, sorry, not that one. Do you use this structure for residential or for commercial only? And and in conjunction with that one, uh, what are the differences? Sorry, when? Let's skip the first part because we've already talked about that. But when does it make sense to use one or the other? So, at what point is that fifteen to twenty thousand dollars justified? Um, well, fifteen thousand, fifteen to twenty thousand dollars would probably be what the cost benefit would be. Would be you're saving the investor fifteen to twenty thousand dollars in taxes. So that would be the break even. Um, but that being said, you know if you are confident that the only people that you are uh, asking for investment help from is friends and family or accredited investors, um, and you know them very well, and you think that you can get away with a shareholders agreement, um, go for it. Um, that is the least friendly for the investor. So again, we go back to the idea that what's most likely for you to be able to make a deal happen? Well, it's one thing to get the property under contract and have great you know, upside potential. But as working partners, the only way that the deal happens is if we're able to convince people to invest their hard-earned money with us, right? If we don't get that fundraising, we have no deal. So now we got to think about it from the shoes of the investor. Well, would they rather put their money in a, a vehicle where they have limited liability or would they put the same money in a deal where they have potential for paying cash calls and deficits and sign for the bank loan and all of that? All things being equal, I would expect that an investor would say, forget all of that. I just want to cut you a check for 100000 or whatever it might be and, and walk away and call it passive. And as a result, maybe that's another way of saying that cost of 15 to 20,000, of which, as we said, you might be able to recoup from your investors as well, makes the deal happen because it provides the terms, which makes it friendly for the investor to say, I'm confident in these folks, I'm going to cut the check, and as a result, still be protected at the same time. Okay, so so um, you're saying like, Lane, this is what we always say to you, like, a good deal is a deal that gets done. Like that's a successful deal. You need to get yep. the deals done in order to be successful. So, and and so that's great. What about like this kind of a question? Can you, like, would you use it then on a residential property? Let's say it's in an, a market that's, you know, set to be upswinging or it's got some sort of transitional areas that are up and coming or whatever it might be that makes them think that it feels right. Would it make sense for just a residential or is this only when you make that jump into those higher numbers that it starts to make sense? Yeah, I'd say it's all a numbers game. Um, so I'd be less likely to see it in a residential space than in the commercial space. But that being said, if your residential investors are asking for those same issues where they want limited liability, where they do not want to have to be on the bank loan, then you might have no choice but to offer um, a GPLP structure for them. I would say less likely to on the residential side because of the size of the numbers. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but you know what? The other, the other elephant in the room is financing. Um, you know, all of our deals are conditioned upon a bank providing 70 plus percent of, of loan to value or, you know, financing. So the banks kind of set the game in terms of the rules that, we're, that we have to play by. And as, as a lot of the commentary has been shared this evening, if banks are doing, are liking the GPLPs more because of the certainty versus the general part versus the joint venture agreements, at some point we might have no choice um, because banks are becoming super stickler and are doing less JV agreement deals and doing more GPLP deals. So just keep that in mind is that again, the Tiffany's point about a deal that gets done is, you know, one that counts a big portion comes down to financing. And so we gotta, we gotta be cognizant of their rule as well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I'll echo your sentiment when you said, you know, you'd have to, make the tax saving uh relevant enough to justify the cost as well because the, the cost to uh, writing up an lpgp uh for every residential deal being twenty thousand extra on closing costs uh can get 
can get a little steep, you know, for uh, let's say a three hundred thousand dollar home or four hundred thousand dollar home. That uh, twenty thousand down, it's it's a severe percentage against that that number. So, yeah, interesting too. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here from our discussion with our accountant too. And that question, I asked the same question to him, and he, he kind of said, you know, there's of course the numbers game where it no longer makes sense and and all that sort of thing. But um, he said, you know, generally speaking, you wouldn't be doing it if you just have like one to four investors kind of thing. Um, it would be something that you're gonna you know justify doing when you're kind of in that higher um, number of investors and you've got more investors in on one project. So that was his. And and you do ask this good question and I believe it's next week, but I didn't check the schedule. What's the best way to learn more about it? Um, yes, Nico is a lawyer. Um, yes, her mail is awesome for answering questions. Always, you can find them both on Facebook here. Um, they will it might be a good idea, guys, if you comment in this thread afterwards. However, I will say that our accountant is also coming on, I believe it's next week, to talk about this exact structure as well. So um, at that time, you'll be able to ask him questions as well. So um, Leo asks, will you please explain about the shares and shareholder rights under an LP? I don't know if sure. that's detailed enough. Yeah? Okay, good. Perfect. Nope. Happy to. So um, the way it works, so think about it as in a joint venture agreement, or in a joint venture, you have a joint venture agreement. In a holding company scenario, you have a shareholders agreement. In a GPLP structure, you have a limited partnership agreement. That limited partnership agreement will tell you what rights you have. So the general partner will be the one that sets those terms. And in a perfect world, uh, the, the limited partner, the investor accepts those because those terms are reasonable to him or her. Um, you know, so the deal is one thing. Um, someone asked about voting power too previously, and that's a great point. The deal might be fantastic in the sense that you bought something under value as we do. Um, there's high upside potential as ours do, but you may not like the fact that you don't have as much rights to vote on all on all cosmetic decisions or what the property manager's rates are, and and you have to be okay with that. Or you might say, nope, I'm going to find an operator, a GP, where I have full rights and I'm actually almost super active in the deal. Depends what floats your boat. Um, but uh, Leo, my answer to you would be just check the limited partnership agreement because that will be where you will find the answer to what rights you have. Perfect. Awesome. All right, Sylvie. Sylvie's rocking and rolling. She's doing lots of stuff. She's got a million things on the go, including some amazing land development stuff, like crazy great stuff. Her question, can registered investments contribute to an LP? Yes, but super rare, like uh, an even bigger unicorn than, than Mel was talking about. It is <laughs> an excessive amount of legal fees to start off with. Uh, Sunset might end up going there down the road based on, con on consumer appetite, but uh, possible, but a unicorn, I would say. All right. Great answer. There's also the, also the element of, um, of registered investments requiring uh, being first or second position sometimes on uh, on the mortgage and the banks really kind of don't like that, but it, you, there's always the way, a way to do it, you know, within, within the LPGP structure. But like Nico said, it's, it's a, a mountain of legal work to get there, but, uh, it's something we might undertake in the future for sure. Okay. So it may, it may be worth it if you're going to go maybe in a bigger way. Um, but if you're just kind of doing a little bit here and there, it's probably not worth your time and effort is what I'm hearing. And from a, you know, 20 year long investor point of view, I'm going, yeah, I know how that is. Like if you got to make it worth it, if you're going to kind of go down certain rabbit holes, right. It sounds like that's one of them. So. Yeah. And, and um, the, trust, the trust companies always uh, work on, on a different, you know, time frame than we do, you know, so, so for them, they might add for extra stuff that might make the deal extend further and further and then extensions and, you know, there's extra cost added to that. So, so that's why uh, right now it's a, a little, a little hard to manage. Yeah. Sounds for sure. Um, so Liz, that's one of our questions that we haven't hit yet. So that's perfect. Thanks for the segue again. So we talked about the benefits and so liability benefits, tax benefits, um, even just, you know, passive, very, very, very clearly passive um, benefits to this kind of a structure. What you guys are the downside? So we know the cost. Okay, it's 20 grand. That's that's expensive. So that's it's got to be worth it. Now, what else are the disadvantages to having this kind of structure? So from the investor point of view, um, the, there are no 
additional disadvantages because again, this is very pro investor. From the operator point of view, other downsides would be there's a lot more paperwork that needs to be done. You need to file with the Securities Commission. You need to register in the different provinces, either where either you reside or where the project is. For Sunset, we go the extra mile of even um, registering nationally. So you could Google us and find it. And again, our investors love that because then again, they get a sense of the professionalism and just being able to find out that we are registered. That goes a, that goes a long way for them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and the idea is that the risk is entirely on the GP. It's entirely on you. So it's flipped. Uh, in the joint venture agreement, you share that, you, the operator, you, the working partner, share that burden with your investors. You all go down in flames together. That's fine. Maybe not fine, but you all, but run. <laughs> you all run. You do what you need to do. Yeah. In the in the GPLP structure, 100% burden is on you. You and your partners go down in flames, but not the investors. So um, that's the, that's the other downside. Uh, you know, you're you're part of the credit application, not your investors, which was I think Tori's question. The cash investors don't sign on the mortgage whatsoever. Um, it's all you. Um, so that's the downside. So the the burden is a lot more clear. Uh, when, when you set up a GPLP structure on the operator's point of view. Perfect. Mel, you got, you, you're the boots on the ground. You've been in this structure now for a little bit. So what's the downside for you? What's, what's part of it that made you go, Hmm, I don't know if I want to do this part. Well, the, uh, first, the first hand, like Nico mentioned, like we, if, uh, if it all goes down, it's, it's all our personal assets. Right. But then, then if we if we take on a project that we wouldn't feel confident about, we wouldn't sign that dotted line anyway. You know, so uh, we we take high scrutiny into our due diligence. Uh, we hire professional firms and and partners in in the environment that let us do our due diligence and give us confidence in, that the project, you know, uh, is is not uh, it's not going to go up in flames. Uh, the only thing you can't really predict at this point, and I, I'd like to say I have a crystal ball and I know the future, but like if there's a landslide and the whole thing goes underground and there's no dirt left, that's when the project's worth zero, you know, because if there's ground left, the ground is still worth something, you know, so so there, for the possibility of it going to zero is is, is almost, you know, like I said, I don't, I don't like to pretend like I know what God will send my way, but... Uh, uh, honestly, uh, that's uh, that's something I'll leave up to him and not me. But uh, if, if we put our names down on it, we're we're pretty confident that. Uh, so 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 that being said, that was the hardest I think thing to come to realization. And then when we saw, like, if, if I was investing my hard-earned cash, and I was given the option of this much risk or no risk or like my risk is limited to the, the money I'm putting in. I, I think I would go, I, I would lean towards, you know, the, the opportunity that gave me the less exposure. If I'm putting in my money, if I'm putting in my sweat equity and I'm going to put my hard work into it, um, then I'm going to risk it all because that's, that's my brand. That's, that's what we do. And that's what we stand behind. And I have partners that feel the same way and are willing to sign that dotted line along with me. So that's a lot of power that comes uh, that comes with that. Awesome. All right. Um, and I'll just somebody tagged in and said on a, you know from an investment point of investors point of view. I assume you may not have rights to vote, so that's a downside. If you do want to have that saying, you do want to have a little bit more involvement. Absolutely, that's a downside. You might want to have that. Um, so then that structure might not be for you. Um, last question we'll take from Samir. So can one LP have multiple investments? And I know we hit this at the very beginning, but it'd be good to kind of tie it all together for those who have jumped on lately. So can one LP have multiple investments with different sets of investors? Or do we need to yeah, have one different help? You can, but it gets super messy and I would not recommend. So it's nice to have um, clear cut things between corporations, projects. I mean, if you were talking about single family homes, it might get, it's more bother than it's worth and it's messy the other way. But when we're talking about big buildings that have, you know, a lot of revenue and tax and issues to be dealing with on their own, um, it's nice to have that clear paperwork for sure. All right, guys. So what do you have going on before I let you go? What's up next? What's new for you? Well, uh, I, I don't want to let the beans out until they're uh, they're in my hands. <laughs> so but uh, we, we have uh, we have a really, uh, really interesting uh, 
things moving really close, really close. Like we, uh, you can almost uh, smell it. <laughs> um, but uh, currently, we have our uh, student project that we're still uh, still raising funds for. Uh, okay. So looking for for limited partners and or um, or and or cash uh, investors if they if we also have that option right now. Uh, we don't want to postpone, um, uh, you know, doing renos and stuff like that. So we we are willing to transition from private funds to LP down the line if it if it needs to be. But uh, go ahead. So Sorry. Mel, I know about your project because I saw your mm -hmm. presentation. But but um, what does that mean, student housing? projects like what are you doing where is it what are you doing uh what does it look like yeah sackville new brunswick 16 unit building uh 15 of the 16 units are two bedroom apartments that we're converting into three bedroom apartments to make create student housing in sackville new brunswick right in front of mount a university the um, uh, the current uh, demographic in Sackville is that their their uh, student housing is actually under renovation for a few years, uh, so there's a lot less rooms available. Uh, they're seeing a record uh, record sign up year, so they're 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 taking on okay. their biggest population yet. Yeah, and you're so you're saying that you have a 16 unit building, you're creating three bedroom ta uh, units for taking them from two bedroom to a three bedroom, which increases the value of your building just right there. You are also then going to be um, renting them out by the room. It is right across the street from the university and that university, that said university has their student housing shut down for a few years because they are renovating those units. Yeah. Okay. That's enough said. That's great. That's pretty amazing. Um, the numbers also look great as well to me. Um, talk about opportunities. So awesome. Um, and if someone were to invest with you, would you, so they would end up with an LP with you, all that kind of stuff. Would you start, um, you know, answering those questions, allow them to see from, you know, the LP side of things, how the GP side of things work? Like, are, are you open to doing that kind of stuff for those who invest with you? yeah we we take time to to build those relationships um some investors are happy with like a we'll do it like a three-on-one meeting like we'll, we'll they'll meet with the three of us simultaneously and some of them prefer like you know to go through me first uh, for the introduction and then through ben after for, for like a, a more detailed look and analysis and then the, the legal uh the legal at the end with nico and maria to to really like answer all the legal questions uh, we send them the legal documents to review, the term sheets to review, all the all the the the, the that that we have on hand to give them so that they can have a review with their lawyer, and get some some clarity. You know, we we don't like to put a a timer on that. You know, we don't like to to give them a deadline, but we we also like to go through the process so that uh, so. But we we're willing to take the time. That's for sure. Awesome. I got to 10 seconds. I just want to just to give a give a quick conclusion in that sense. And that is, um, you know, we've been blessed with the support of Fearless from the past. We've got other operators who we've invited basically to say to Tiffany's point, come learn with us. You know, we're the ones putting up our personal guarantees. If you want to do this, absolutely all power to you. But take the training wheels without having to put the personal guarantee on the line. Come invest with us as LPs. See our secret sauce. We'll teach you along the way. It's all about sharing and caring. And then when you're ready to fly, go fly. And so in our previous deal, uh, 39 unit in Bathurst, which closed about a month ago or two months ago, three months ago, uh, we had two uh, people uh, from Fearless who we know, and you all know very well, uh, who are operators in their own right, who took that opportunity to learn from us and they're, they're doing it. And I fully expect that they are gonna do it soon. They'll probably announce that they're doing their own GPLP structure in the very near future. So open invitation, you know, it's a complicated space, but we'll make it as easy as possible for you to learn from us. Do it without the cuts and bruises, you know, come play in our, in our sandbox. Mm -hmm. Nice. Awesome. How do we reach you if you want to play in that? So I actually meant to get a hold of you, Mel, after your presentation, because I was like, holy, okay, I want to see. Yeah, I'm, yeah. So anyways, how do we get a hold of you guys? What's the best way? Uh, so we're here on Facebook uh, at, uh, well, we're, we're here on Phyllis, Mel Goodboo, or her Mel and Rachel Goodboo. Um, and we're also, you can find us at uh, DJC Properties. Uh, that we have a, a DJC Properties here on Facebook uh, and DJC Properties Info at gmail.com. Uh, that's our email where you can, you can get a hold of us and, uh, and ask for personal information. Message me on Facebook, Perfect. to be honest, guys. We're, we're pretty responsive. 
Okay, so I just tagged you, but maybe you guys can both make a comment in this feed. That way people can find you. There's well, stuff there. Information will be in the feed, guys. And we will talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving us the, you know, boots on the ground version of those that are, you know, in the trenches doing it right now in this changing environment. Um, thanks for helping and being free to, uh, or open to offering your information. So really appreciate it. It's been an Cheers, honor. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Cheers. And we'll see you guys next week for Tractical Tuesday. I believe it's the accountant talking on this subject, but I should confirm that. However, we will see you guys next week. Cheers, everyone. Have a great week.